Hi everybody, my name is Jeremy Siskin. I'm the author of Playing Solo Jazz Piano, and I'm the author of the Jazz Piano Fundamentals series. And get ready for a spot on Jerry Seinfeld impression here. What's the deal with the sharp nine? That's the subject of today's video. What's the deal? Sometimes it's sharp, sometimes it's nine. Okay, enough of that. If you haven't turned off <laughs> your, uh, your video yet, congratulations on an excellent sense of humor. Um, so the reason I wanted to make this video is every semester I teach my students about altertones and my take on altertones, and I don't think it's anywhere outside of the norm, is that there's basically four different tones that we can add to an altered dominant, right? We can add the flat nine. We can add, I guess I already spoiled it by saying the sharp nine. We can add the flat five or sharp 11, right? These are two names for the same pitch, the pitch of flat five above the, uh, above the root, a tritone above the root, or our, flat, our sharp five or flat 13. So of these four um, altered tones, I'm a believer that you can pretty much always throw them into dominant chords. But I would say that the flat nine and the flat 13 flow beautifully in circle of fifths progressions like a two, five, one, right? So if we're, you know, using kind of standard voicings for a two, five, one in C, D minor seven to G seven to C major, we could throw in the flat nine. We could show it, throw in, excuse me, the sharp five or flat 13, E flat over the G7. And then very frequently we could put both in. And there's really two reasons why these just flow so beautifully. The first one is that these two tones are borrowed from what we would call the parallel minor of C, right? If we're doing a two, five, one in C, we're in the key of C. And C minor would be the parallel minor. So the E flat and the A flat are both part of the key signature of C minor. Okay, the sharp 11 also works pretty well in this context. In this case, it would be a C sharp or D flat. Not bad, right? Um, and the sharp 11 also works beautifully in some other contexts. For instance, for, uh, for example, <laughs> I don't know why that word escaped me, uh, in Take the A Train and in lots of other tunes, maybe The Girl from Ipanema is another good example, we might move from the one chord to the 505. So D dominant seven. And this is a great place, if you've ever played Take the A Train, you know, to add in the sharp 11 or flat five. Of course, in Take the A Train, that note's actually like in the melody, so you don't have a choice. But in other situations where we have that secondary dominant, that's a great place to add the sharp 11. If we're playing Girl from Ipanema, we're going from F major to G7 for the first two chords. The sharp 11's a pretty, pretty good sound for that chord. Another place where we really typically use the sharp 11 is in what we call a backdoor 2-5-1. So coming back to C, the backdoor two five one would be F minor to B flat seven to C major, and in that B flat seven, that sharp eleven E natural in this case would be a very common addition to put in. All right, so that's a real crash course in three of these four different altitudes. But now is the time to ask, what's the deal with the sharp nine? Okay, so the sharp nine does not plug and play into circle of fifths progressions like the, um, like the two, five, one. So if I try these exact same voicings, and if I try to replace the ninth with the sharp ninth, I think you're gonna agree it sounds pretty weird. And there's at least two things happening there. One is that this B flat really wants to pull up technically it's an A sharp, but it's written here as a B flat um, because it's a sharp nine, right? It's leading upwards. And I'm gonna show you a way to make it pull up. I'm also gonna show you a way to make it pull down. 
Um, so that's one thing that's happening. The other thing that's happening is we're getting this weird mix of major and minor, right? If I take out the B natural, we have really a G minor sound. And this is the first thing to know about the sharp nine. What's the deal? The first thing that's the deal is that the sharp nine is enharmonically equivalent. Oh man, there's your big words. Uh, enharmonically equivalent to the minor third. So one of the things that this means is if you ever see a chord that looks like it has both a major and minor third, chances are pretty good that that minor third is actually functioning here as the sharp nine. But one implication of this is that this chord, a dominant seventh with a sharp nine, has a really bluesy sound, right? Because there's nothing more bluesy than mixing major and minor thirds. And so one location, you know, if we're not going to use it so much in two five ones, one location that we use a sharp nine a lot is in the blues. And so if we have a dominant one chord, like in a kind of blues context, or a dominant four chord, right, which is also often used in the blues. Uh, I made one a Roman numeral and one a regular numeral. What do you call a regular numeral? It's not Roman, it's something. Um, anyway, if you have these bluesy uh, chords, dominant one, the dominant four, this is going to be a really good place to put in a sharp nine. For instance, some of my students are playing honeysuckle rows. <laughs> to this moment where you have a dominant one chord, right? We're in F and I'm playing in F7. I'll show you, All right? This could be a really nice spot to add that sharp nine. Okay. Now, we also frequently use this chord when playing funk R&B or other tunes that have a kind of dominant vamp. Like I always give this example, and my apologies if you heard this before, of James Brown's I Feel Good, right? It's a blues tune, actually. And the voicing that I hear in this, and honestly in a lot of other James Brown music, uh, we're in the key of D here, is this three note voicing. I've got the bass note in there just to show you. So the, the voicing is these three notes, the third, the seventh, and then the sharp nine. And it's amazing. There's so much richness just in those three notes. And then one of the things that's very cool about this voicing in particular is that when it moves to the four chord, which blueses tend to do, everything gets to move down by just a half step. You keep the same exact interval structure. And now you get a dominant seventh with the 13th, the seventh, the third, and the 13th over G. So you really have to move barely at all. playing the seventh, sharp nine, third, and the flat 13 together. So in bluesy, funky context, the sharp nine is definitely going to be added. I can imagine a question. I'm psychic for one of you out there, <laughs> um, which is like, do I always include the major third with the sharp nine? Because they kind of clash. And the answer is yes, you must include the major third. Otherwise, you're playing a minor chord. <laughs> and minor chords are lovely, but there's times for dominance and there's times for minor. So don't get rid of the major third, even if it's right next to the sharp nine. Third thing in our subject of what's the deal? Um, okay, is that we might move the sharp nine to the flat nine in order to bring it down. This is a pretty common move in jazz. What happened to my sheet here? What's going on? Sharp nine to flat nine. 
So if my 251 is this, okay, in the friendly key of C, if I do want to use the sharp nine in this context, one nice trick is to start on the sharp nine, move from the flat nine, and then it resolves nicely to the fifth. Now, number four is gonna make that sound even better, which is that the sharp nine loves the flat 13. It's a love affair. What can you say? Sometimes when you know, you know. Um, and I, I have a theory about this, which is that like the intervals are just awkward between the fifth and the sharp nine, because it forms, again, this minor triad. Whereas if we put the flat 13 in there, there's much less awkwardness. So now with combining three and four, check this out. That sounds really good, right? We've taken that sharp nine that didn't necessarily sound so great and we've made it resolve to the flat nine so it can then resolve to the fifth of the one chord. And we've added the 13th to get rid of that weird minor triad interval thing that was happening that I think can be distracting. All right, number five, and I think my final chapter of what's the deal? Um, if my wife sees this, she's gonna be so upset. It's such a bad impression. Um, what's number five again? I'm distracted. Oh, so there are some ways where you can make the sharp nine go up like it wants to do. So the sharp nine can go up to the major seventh. And there's this voicing formula that I really like. I'm gonna start in the same place for my two, five, one voicing. And you can imagine doing all this without roots. So if you're just comping for, for somebody else, then you would just play those top four notes. I'm gonna go to that same next voicing, right? And if I were going down, I'd go down to the flat nine resolve. But here, I'm going to actually let the sharp nine do what it was designed to do as a sharp note and go up. And so I'm going to resolve everything here. It's nice, right? Um, there's no E flat. <laughs> so if you look at, uh, for those of you who know jazz voicing as well, this is technically a so what voicing, right? It's got this, um, it's got this build of four notes organized in fourths, one third on top. And so what we did here, what I did, I'm not the first person to ever think about of this, is that the seventh goes on top, and so the sixth replaces it on bottom. Now you might wonder what that G is doing in there. <laughs> and that G is basically, it would be a really awkward spacing. It's not actually the end of the world. It could be that, but the spacing, the spacing gets nicer with the G in there. And one final coup de gras, which is that we could put these three altered tones we've been talking about, the flat nine, the sharp nine, and the flat 13th all together. And then this flat nine actually is gonna resolve down to that G. And the sharp nine resolves up to the B. Look at that one more time. So the two top notes are gonna go outside, uh, going to go away from one another. And then we get that beautiful voice. So those are a few choice um, answers to the question, what's the deal with the sharp nine? I uh, hope you enjoyed it. If you liked that, you'll find some stuff, lots of stuff about altered tones in Jazz Piano Fundamentals book number one. If you watched all the way, why don't you comment with Soup Nazi or another favorite Seinfeld reference since this, uh, this, uh, this little video was was peppered with incredible Seinfeld performances. Thanks for watching everyone, see you soon.